welcome to the uh, first actual lecture of this course. Uh, it's called the GPU Programming Basics. And uh, the first thing, first question I would like to cover is that why would someone like to use a GPUs? And what, what is so special about them? And if you go and look at the NVIDIA's materials, you will uh, discover that they'll tell you that if you compare one of the GPUs against a CPU, then the GPU will have significantly higher instruction throughput and significantly higher in memory bandwidth. And on top of that, they are saying that all this performance is, is being delivered in a relatively small price and power envelope. And now the question is that what does this mean? What, the, what does the NVIDIA mean when they say that it's a higher instruction throughput and memory bandwidth? And what is this a price and power envelope? So first, Let's look at the uh, instruction throughput, which is usually measured as, as in terms of a flops per second. And I have taken uh, three different platforms here. The first one is a quad core Intel Skylake CPU uh, for cores. And for that, the theoretical peak performance could be somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 gigapulse per second. If you then move on to a 14 core Xeon CPU that can be found from the, uh, from the uh, Kepenekaise nodes that you are using to this course, the theoretical peak performance around 1200 gigapulse. And then for NVIDIA V100 GPU, the theoretical peak performance for uh, is around 7000 gigaflops or 7 teraflops. And these numbers are for double precision operations. Then if we go and look at the uh, memory bandwidth, then for the quad core CPU, assuming that it has uh, two memory channels, you would get around 35 gigabytes per second, which of course depends on the amount of type of memory you have in the machine. But 30, 35 is probably on the correct, around the correct neighborhood for the uh, gigabytes per second it can actually pull from the memory. For the uh, Xeon CPUs that we have in, uh, in uh, Gemenekaise, it's around 100 gigabytes per second. And what NVIDIA is promising V100, it's 900 gigabytes per second. So this is almost a factor of 10 improvement in memory bandwidth. So in both terms of the uh, raw computer performance and memory bandwidth, the GPU is clearly, at least on the paper, much more powerful than the, uh, than the CPU. Then when you look at the power usage, these numbers are, are just a guesses, but usually Intel reports that for the desktop GPU, CPUs will pull around 90 watts of power to run. And for the Xeon is around 140 watts, and for the NVIDIA V100 is around 250 watts of power that is pulling. Of course, you must always consider the entire machine. So you cannot just take these numbers by themselves and say that if you're doing computational CPU, this is the amount of power you use because it's also the motherboard and other systems in the uh, computer that are pulling power from the wall. And with the GPU, there is always going to be also a CPU pulling power. So you kind of have to combine these figures here to get the true, true amount of power that the machine is using. Price-wise, again, there's a lot of variation, but for this kind of medium rates, uh, Sky, uh, CPU from Intel costs around uh, $400 maybe. And then for the Xeon CPU, you will end up paying around $2,000. And for the V1 of Tesla, I test checked that the latest price was around $10,000. But considering the fact that the newer A100 is going to cost you over $20,000, then it's very likely the time when you had bought one of the CPUs, you might have been paid double this for the GPU since they are, very, they, they are really high demand. But now when we look at these numbers in the perspective that how many gigaflops you will get per watt and how many gigabytes per second you end up transferring per watt, you know that when you increase the number of cores, it gets better in the terms of uh, gigaflops. And when you arrive all the way to GPU, there, based on the numbers I have just shown you, you will get around uh, 28 gigabytes, uh, gigaflops per computing power per watt. And the similar, and for memory bandwidth, you will get around 3.6 gigabytes per second per watt. So if you are simply interested in seeing how much computing power you get per watt of power consumed, then the GPU seems to be entirely its own league. For the price-wise, using the number sizes provided, it seems that if that if you just look at how much computer power you get, you will end up paying around the same amount of money. So this is what NVIDIA means that they are in a similar 
price envelope. And this is what NVIDIA means when they are saying that it's a similar power envelope. And then all these numbers were for double precision, but if you are willing to reduce the precision to let's say half precision, then what is usually happening is that you about double the uh, raw computer power of the uh, machine. But if you're willing to go even lower than that, so you go to half precision, then the NVIDIA V100 can provide 112 teraflops of computing power. And this is a, compl this is a completely a different kind of number than you would get with the Xeon, where you cannot even use half precision. Instead, you are forced to use a single precision to do the same computation. So there is really no competition between these two numbers if your application can actually take advantage of the half precision that half, half precision computations. But of course, there is always going to be a catch. These numbers don't really uh, guarantee you anything. They will just tell you what is the theoretical maximum. And the first catch is that the GPUs are highly parallel, meaning that if you want to get the peak performance of the card, you will need thousands of threads. So if you look at regular CPU, where you have just a handful of threads can usually use all of the uh, all of the uh, computing power and the memory bandwidth. If you would try to use the same number of threads on a GPU, you will usually end up using only a very small fraction of the what is theoretically possible. So you really have to push the number of threads to uh, thousands, and in most cases, way past thousands of threads to actually get the performance out of it. And then I also have this longer list here of different kind of uh, problems you might encounter. First of all, a GPU program programming is somewhat difficult. As I already mentioned, it requires sort of parallelism. So if your uh, application doesn't really scale past a couple of threads, then it's very unlikely that the GPU will make it any faster because you have to go uh, thousands of tens of thousands of threads to make to actually make use of all the competent power. And the second thing that can make GPU programming difficult is the fact that the code that actually runs on the GPU is usually written in, uh, in a modified C++. That can be for some people more difficult, more difficult language to use than let's say uh, Python. Then going to the GPUs themselves, the CUDA cores that everyone is talking about, they are not really true cores because they share various resources such as schedulers and caches. And then these attention cores that would give you this extreme high half precision computing power, they are usually even more limited than the regular CUDA cores. So they have to be programmed differently than regular CPUs. Then there is always a problem with memory, mainly that the GPUs usually have less memory than you have a RAM in your machine. And therefore you often have to move the data around. So you have to move the data from the RAM to the GPU's video memory and back. Then we must remember that certain kind of memory is much faster. So even though under suitable conditions, GPU could simply access your main memory, but if you want to access it with this uh, 900 uh, gigabytes per second, you really have to have the data in the uh, GPU's own memory. And the third compli complication when it comes to memory is that you have to use the memory in the right way. Otherwise, you will end up using only a small fraction of the theoretical uh, bandwidth. Then when we go and talk about algorithms, well, all algorithms simply are not suitable for GPUs. And even some better cases, you will only be slightly faster on a GPU. So let's say you are twice as fast on a V100 than on a Geon. Does it really make sense to buy the extra, extra money to get the double the performance if you end up buying uh, several times more in terms of dollars? And the last point with the GPUs, they are not all equally powerful. This means that some GPUs, especially the ones that lower end ones that you buy for gaming, they are not very good at double precision computations. They, they, the theoretical throughput there is usually a fraction of the theoretical throughput of the computing oriented cards. And then these tensor cores, many cards don't have them. And if you try to run half precision computation on a GPU that doesn't have them, they, they might actually end up running the computation slower. So now that I have uh, told you some, something about GPU programming in general, I can now move to talking about CUDA. So CUDA, is, uh, CUDA, CUDA stands for Compute Unified Device Architecture. And it's a parallel programming platform and API that is created by NVIDIA 
by their for their own GPUs. So if you want to use, let's say, MD GPUs, then uh, CUDA is not the tool to use there. You have to use, for example, OpenCL. CUDA can be used in many different ways. The most direct way is that you will simply use CUDA C++, C++ or CUDA Fortran. In that case, you will be using directly the CUDA API calls. You can also do it directly through Python using the wrappers in a Python, Perl, Fortran, Java, Ruby, and Lua. In those cases, they, they provide a set of wrapper functions that wrap inside them the actual CUDA C slash C++ functions. But it is still used in the same way as, as in the CUDA C slash C++. Then you can use CUDA indirectly using, let's say, OpenACC. And in this case, even though you write the code using the OpenACC pragmas, the actual code that gets compiled with the GPU goes through the uh, CUDA layer. So it's still, everything goes to the CUDA. And the same also happens, let's say, with OpenCL or Direct Compute OpenGL. There it's also, once the code actually gets to the GPU, it has actually gone through some of the CUDA libraries. During this course, we are, we are using the CUDA C++ C++, because that is the most base form for, for a CUDA. Uh, CUDA comes with its own compiler called NVCC. And what it does, it takes the code that is meant for a GPU and compiles it to something called PTX. That is then later on compiled by the graphics driver into a binary that runs on the GPU. And everything else, the part of the code that, that is not meant to run on the GPU, is going to offload it to the host compiler. Let's say, for example, GCC, G++, in case if you use the FOSS CUDA uh, model on Kepnekaise. CUDA also comes with a set of uh, libraries. First of all, there is this CUDA runtime library that is loaded every time when you are, when you are running a CUDA application. Then we have uh, CUDA basic linear algebra routines called CUPLAS. And this is a library that we will be actually using some, in some of the hands-ons. Then we have CUDA Fourier transformer library. We have a library for doing sparse uh, matrix, uh, matrix uh, uh, stuff with the sparse matrices. And then we have a library for doing deep neural network computations. And many third party libraries that have GPU acceleration are actually offloading computation of these libraries. For example, if you use TensorFlow, it will actually run a lot of the GPU specific stuff by calling functions in the QTDM library. For most use cases, you should not go and implement something yourself if it's already, if the functionality already exists in one of these libraries, because uh, in that, that case, you go, in most cases, we'll probably end up running slower than the highly optimized functionality implemented in one of these uh, NVIDIA's own libraries. At this point, have we had any questions in the Q&A or, or the chat? OK. So good. Uh, I'm going to start from where many other courses, programming courses start, which is a Hello World program that can be found also in the Git repository. And it is not, for the face of it, it doesn't look that much more complex than a regular Hello World. We have a printer function, but in this case, we have one of them, two of them. The first one is going to print a GPU says Hello World, and the second print of statement is going to say Hello, host says Hello World. And if you want to go and run this code, you will, of course, run load the necessary models, CUDA force and build env. You use the NVCC to compile this program, and then you use the S run or the S patch to place the uh, job into a patch queue. And when it finally settles to GPU, it will tell you host says hello world, and the GPU says hello world. And now the question is, what is happening here? How, how is it printing out these uh, two lines to the screen? And the key thing to understand is here that there is actually two, three different objects that are interacting here. The third object is the host that contains the CPU cores and the main memory, the RAM. Then we have a device, which is the GPU. And inside it, we have a several CUDA cores here. And they are both connected through this PCIe uh, interconnect. And in this visualization, you can see that on the host side, it's outputting on the screen, host says hello world, and on the GPU side, it's telling, printing out 
GPU says hello world. So if you now would go through this example line by line, the first thing to understand is that all the code that is meant to run on the GPU must be written inside a special function called a kernel. And the way you create a kernel is that you will add this global keyword in front of the function. And this tells the NVCC compiler that this is now GPU specific code and it should compile itself, compile it using the uh, CUDA compiler. Uh, there are a couple of limitations for what, what kernel can be. First of all, the return type of the uh, function must always be null. So uh, kernel can never return any, anything like a double or void or uh, integer. All the threads that are going to execute this kernel will enter the body of the function from the beginning. So there is no, there is no any kind of fork joins type of approach where you would suddenly span a set of threads they all start at the beginning of the body of the function and they will exit either from the exit statement, return statement, or from the end of the uh, body of the function. In a manner that NVIDIA calls single instruction multiple stream, S-I-M-T. Then when you go and look at what is inside the main function, we know that we have something that looks pretty much like a function call. It will say hello word, but then we have supplemented with this, uh, uh, this, uh, this extra brackets here. And for now, only thing you have to know that this places the kernel into a queue known as a stream. St known to a stream, and it will then stay in the queue until the GPU becomes ready to execute the kernel. And the key thing to understand here is that the main, the host thread that calls this, issues this kernel, will return right away. It doesn't wait for the uh, kernel to actually finish. And that's why in the end, after it, you have to call CUDA device synchronize that tells the host thread that it has to wait until the stream is empty, meaning that the kernel has been executed. And when it comes to these two brackets, these two brackets here, I will return back to this later on during the uh, presentation. But from now on, you have to know that one one basically tells CUDA that the number of threads that should execute the kernel is going to be one. So here is a summary of it. What we had earlier, we had a kernel that has this printf statement inside it. And then inside the main routine, we have the code that actually runs on the GPU. And here we have one printf statement, then we issue the kernel. And, may, and at some point in the future, the GPU will start executing the kernel. And then the host is going to wait until the kernel has printed out its own line. And now I would like to move on to something that is slightly more complex. So I picked a very simple operation for numerical linear algebra where we are given a vector x, which is basically just an array of double precision numbers. And we are going to multiply each element in the, in the vector with the scalar alpha. If you would go and implement the CPU, the function you are writing is going to be something very similar. It's just called ax. You will pass the length of the vector n you will pass the scalar alpha that is used to multiply, and you will pass a pointer to the, uh, to the vector. And then inside the function in a for loop, you will simply loop over all the elements of the vector x, and, and one by one, you are going to load the corresponding element, multiply with the alpha, and store it back to the matching element of the vector. On the GPU side, if you would turn this into a kernel, of course, the first thing you do is to add the global keyword at the very beginning, Otherwise, the, uh, the prototype for the function will look identical. You give the length of the vector, you give the scala alpha, and you give the pointer to the vector itself. But everything inside this uh, body of the function is now different. From somewhere, we have got these three new variables called block id x, block dim x, and thread id x. And then we have somehow replaced the uh, for loop with the if block. So clearly, something has happened to the uh, body of the function itself. And I would now like to go and explain what these three variables are and what they are used for and how we can do the same computation without any form. And to do that, I would like to go back to the earlier figure where I had the host, I had the device and the PCIe connect. But what I've also now drawn here is the fact that the device is actually made out of from several streaming multiprocessors or SMPs. And inside one of these, each one of these SMPs, 
we will have a set of CUDA cores. And each one of these CUDA cores is capable of executing several threads at the same time. And this is, and this is actually something we want to do because the scheduler can now use the excess number of threads to hide various latencies that come from the execution of the instructions and the fetching data from the main memory. So the key thing to understand is that in it, instead of having this one core, one thread thing you usually happen with the CPUs, with the GPUs, you actually want to oversubscribe the cores with the excess number of threads. And now when you consider the fact that the high-end GPU can contain thousands of CUDA cores, and for each core, we usually want to have uh, multiple threads running on it, the total number of threads can be, in many cases, be measured in millions. And now the question is that how do we, how does each one of these million threads know what they are supposed to be doing and how we can write the code in such a way that the same code can handle different problem sizes and also run with the different GPUs that might have a different number of SMP and CUDA cores in them. And the way this is done in CUDA is that we will take the whole pool of threads that are going to be executed the kernel and we will divide it into blocks called thread blocks. So in this sample, I have divided the uh, thread blocks in uh, six thread blocks. And this block dim variable tells you how many threads there are in, the, in each thread block. So in this example, the thread block actually has a two dimensional indexing. So the thread blocks dim x will tell you how many threads you have in the x dimension, eight in this case, and thread dim, uh, uh, block dim, block dim, I'm sorry, block dim y tells you how many threads you have in the y dimension. And then all in, for all each one of these thread blocks, it's going to get its own uh, index number that is accessed through this block ID x variable. So in this instance, in the x dimension, we would have indices 0, 0, 1, and 2. And in the y dimension, we would have the indices 0 to 1. And all of these uh, threads now, thread blocks now belong to a grid. And the dimension of the grid is going to be three blocks in the x dimension and two blocks in the y, y dimension. And this information is stored to the grid dim variable. So in this example, this thread block here would have the block ID x equal zero and a block ID x y equal zero. And this three block here would have the block ID x equal two and a block ID x y equal one. And in for all these threads, in all these thread blocks, the grid dim x would be three and the grid dim y would be two. So the overall idea of what to do with these uh, thread blocks is that we will take all the computational work we want to compute on the GPU, and we will divide it into self-contained tasks that are all meant to be mutually independent from each other. And then each one of these uh, task subtasks we have created here is going to assign to a one thread block. And it is thread block indices here that are used to identify which subtask belongs to which thread block. So in this example, we would have all the work divided into nine tasks, and then we will create nine thread blocks using a two-dimensional indexing. And for example, this thread block here that would have an index zero, one, would know that this uh, task belongs to it. Belongs to it. And what it allows to do is that now the CUDA runtime system can go and schedule these uh, thread blocks to a different SMPs. And since we have guaranteed that all of these uh, tasks are mutually in, uh, independent from each other, the uh, runtime system is actually allowed to schedule them in any order it desires. And this allows CUDA to run the same application on uh, two different GPUs. For example, in this example, we have a very GPU that consists of many SMPs. And in this instance, all of these uh, thread blocks can actually run in parallel. But if we have a lower end GPU that has only two SMPs, then, the run, then it would actually schedule the uh, thread blocks in pairs sequentially. But it would in the end still end up executing exactly the same computations because the programmer has guaranteed the CUDA runtime system that all these uh, tasks can be executed in any arbitrary order. 
Then if we go and look at inside the thread blocks, they are the threads that are inside the block actually have their own local indexing. And that indexing is accessed through the thread ID X variable. So in this instance, we have eight threads in the X dimension indexed with one, two, three, four, five, all the way to seven. And in the Y dimension, we have threads indices from zero to one. And the key thing to notice here is that these uh, thread, this thread IDX variable is not unique. So even though it's unique inside the thread block, in each block, we will have thread zero, zero. So we must somehow find a way of taking the uh, thread block indices and the uh, local indices inside thread indices inside the thread block and turn them into some form of global indexing where each thread has its own unique uh, thread ID. And that is exactly what this uh, weird looking line does in the kernel. So this thread ID, ID is going to be the global index number that is unique to each thread. And the way we compute it is that we will, for each thread here, we will take the block IDX and multiply it with the block DIMX. And in that case, the first thread in the, uh, in the first thread block is going to get zero times eight, it's going to get zero as the global index number. In the second thread block, it's going to get one times eight, so it's going to get eight. And in the third thread block, it's going to get two times eight, so it's going to be 16. And the last thing we do here, we are going to add the thread's local index number on top of what we computed earlier. In that, and in that way, in the first thread block, we will have one, two, zero, one, two, three, all the way to seven. In the second thread block, we will start incrementing on top of eight. So we get eight, nine, blah, 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 all the way to 15. And in the third thread block, we will start on 16 and we will start incrementing on top of it all the way to 23. So the only thing now to explain is that why do we have this if block here now instead of, uh, instead of the for loop. And the reason if it's there is that usually when you're running a CUDA application, you will end up having an excess number of threads. And in this instance, if the end happens to be uh, 21, then if we have these extra three threads here, they don't have, they don't have anything to do because the, because the vector will end here. And what the if statement does here, it's going to take the global index number that we just computed and compare it against the n. And if it turns out the thread I index number would go past the length of the vector, then they will simply skip the if block. A couple of remarks I have to make here to the way how I've drawn these figures. First of all, the thread blocks should be reasonably large. What it means in practice is that the thread blocks that are smaller than 32 uh, don't usually have any uh, practical use. And the reason why this is will become apparent during the second lecture of the day. At the moment, the maximum number of threads you can have in a thread block is 1024. And my personal recommendation is that you will set the thread block size to be 256, and then you will tweak it if necessary to get the value that gives you the best performance. Usually the size, the total number of threads in a thread block should be a multiple of 32 due to something called warps but this is something I will return back during the afternoon uh, lecture as well. But for now, just know that you should select something between 32 and 1024 and increment in, in, in increments of 32. When it's come to the grid size that specifies how many thread blocks we have, then you must remember that each thread blocks runs on a single SMP. And for optimal performance, each SMP should have some work to assign to it. So therefore, we should have at least as many thread blocks as that there are SMPs on the GPU. And for that, you should know that the NVIDIA V100 GPU has 80 SMPs in it. So for minimum, you should have 80 thread blocks running. In practice, that usually only gives you a fraction of the performance, but this is the lower limit. And the last thing, these remarks, I'm mentioning you that you, we had this three-dimensional indexing, both for the thread, threads that are in thread blocks and the thread blocks that are, that are in the grid. But on the hardware level, it is, there is going to be just one dimensional indexing. And the indexing will first run over. Yes, yes, there's a question. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, so the question was that if what do the idle threads do in case of this if statement? They will simply skip over this uh, what is inside the block here and uh, go to the end of the uh, end of the body of the function. So it is as if they never existed. They will just compute this uh, global index number and then skip what is inside the if block. Did that answer the question? Okay, but the previous point was saying that even though the indexing for the threads inside thread blocks can be three-dimensional and the indexing of the thread the grid can also be three-dimensional, hardware level there is this one-dimensional indexing. And the indexing will run, first run through the indices in the X dimension, then it will run them through in the Y dimension, and then it will run the indices through in Z dimension. And this is again something I will return back during the afternoon lecture. Then that was all the stuff that was related to kernel. And now we must tell what the host is doing in order to get the kernel launch for the GPU. And the first thing the host must do, it must allocate memory for the vector X. And here I'm just using the regular malloc call to allocate n double precision numbers. And then I'm just going to initialize them with some data. But then for the GPU computations, we actually have to allocate a second buffer that resides on the GPU called dx. And for that, CUDA provides you a function called CUDA malloc that is going to return the pointer that resides points to the global memory. And then we will give them that how many bytes we want to allocate. And in this case, it's going to be n doubles in length. And in this figure, I have these three terms appearing. The first one is called the host memory. So this is basically just the RAM you have in the machine. Then we have a global memory that is the video memory that you usually have for a couple of gigabytes. And then inside this SMP, you have something called shared memory that is on the chip itself. And the host memory is of course accessible by the host, but under suitable conditions, any threat that is running on the GPU can also access the global memory to the PCIe. But in order for that to happen, you actually have to tell the CUDA that that is going to happen. If you're trying to access it without doing that, then it will just complain to you that this is an invalid memory address. Then we have the global memory that is accessible by all the threads in all thread blocks. And that's why it's called the global, it's accessible by anyone. And then the shared memory, because it's located in, inside SMP, it is only accessible to the threads that belong to the same thread block. And that is where the word shared comes from. It is only accessible to the threads that are in the same thread block. Then once the host has actually allocated memory, it must move the data that now resides in the host memory inside in the X buffer and move it to this uh, GPU side, this, this buffer called DX. And in order for that to happen, you have to call CUDA main copy API call. And you're telling it that you want to move from host to a device. So I have to specify what is the direction of the transfer. You specify how many bytes are being transferred. And then you specify the source, which is an X in this case, in host memory. And then you specify what is, what is, this, what is the destination, which is in this case, the X. So this will now start transferring the, all the data from the host memory over at the PCIe connect into the device, mem device, device memory. And the key thing to understand about this API call is that it is blocking, meaning that when the host thread finally returns from this function, it's it is guaranteed that all the data has been moved to the GPU. So at this point, it would be safe to go and launch the kernel. And that is exactly what we are doing here. So you can see that we have the similar notation as before. We call the name of the kernel, then we have the brackets, and then we are passing the arguments for, for the kernel. But now we have these two additional variables that we created. And the first variable is going to tell us how many threads there are in a thread block. So this number, this 256 we specify here, it is going to become the block dim, uh, block dim x. Then the second one we have here called blocks is going to specify well, how many thread blocks we are creating. So this will become the grid dim x in the kernel itself. And then the first variable now is going to, first variable inside these brackets is going to tell CUDA how many thread blocks 
And the second one is going to tell it how many threads there are within a thread range. And otherwise, these arguments you are giving, we are giving an alpha. But the key thing here to see is that instead of passing the variable x, we are actually passing the variable dx. So the argument you give to the kernel, the, the pointer that you give the kernel must point to the uh, global memory. If the kernel would have been more complicated, so instead of using just the trade ID X and block ID X, then you could actually use specify the dimensions of the thread block like this. So you specify how many threads in the X dimension, how many Y dimension, and how many in Z dimension. And the same way you can specify how many thread blocks there are in the X dimension, how many are in the Y dimension, and how many are in the Z dimension. You could have also done it many different ways. For example, you could have just given the number here. So you specify that it's 256 threads in a thread block. And then you specify that you want a reasonable number of thread blocks. And this notation where we take n plus uh, block dim x minus 1 divided block dim x, that is simply a very convenient way of making sure that when you multiply the number of uh, thread blocks with the size of the thread block, you will get at least n threads. I personally prefer approach where I define a function called diff sale that will basically uh, divide a with b and then it will round answer upwards to the next integer. And then I would do 256 threads and then n divided by 256 56 rounded to the next integer thread blocks. And at this point, once you issue the kernel in some point in the future, the kernel will start running. So the, all the threads are started, they will start executing the kernel. And now they can go and access this data that is uh, resides in a buffer in a global memory. And then you will just call the CUDA mem copy again. This time you are specifying that the copy is going to happen from device to the host. So you specify the dimension of the transfer and the source is going to be in the global memory, and the destination is going to be in the host memory. And since this is a blocking call, after the host thread returns from this function, it is guaranteed that all the data will now reside in the host memory. And the only thing that's left is a cleanup. We, for the X, for X buffer that is in host memory, we will just call the free function, but for the DX that was in the host uh, global memory, you have to use CUDA free function. And one common problem that people usually do at this point is that they will call free for the DX. And the most, in most cases, this will give you a segmentation fault. So when you're doing the hand zones and you get the segmentation fault, please make sure that you are reading all the, all the pointers that are point to the uh, global memory with the CUDA free function. And at this point, we can again go and uh, load the necessary models, compile the code, and run it. And what the code also does, it, it compares the result computed by the uh, GPU to the result computed by CPU. And in this case, the residual we get happens to be zero. Yes. Uh, the question was that when we had these uh, thread blocks defined here, that are they statically defined during the compile time, or can you set them during the runtime? And the answer is that you can set them during the runtime. So, so in many of the hand zones where this actually the size of the problem size is actually read as an argument from the command line, and that of course it's going to affect that how many thread blocks we are. So definitely they they can be changed during the runtime. So, okay, now I have just one more topic of cover, which is error handling, which is always a bit boring. But with CUDA program, the GPU program in general, I must tell you that you really have to understand how the errors behave, because it is a very counterintuitive thing for various reasons. So most CUDA API calls, they will return an error type, that is a type CUDA error T. And if the API call is successful, then you will get something called CUDA success. And in most cases, that means that everything went fine. Uh, the kernel 
returns nothing. So if you want to know whether or not the kernel launch was successful, then you must use a separate function called CUDA get last error, which is going to simply check what was the previous error code, and then it is going to return it and set it back to CUDA success. So it is going to reset the error code. If you don't want to reset error code, you can use a second function called CUDA peak the last error, and this will simply return you the previous error code and leave it to that. So that's why it's just called that it's peaking the error code. Once you get the error code from a function, you can use a function called CUDA get error name to turn the error code into a C string that basically tells you what was the error code. And there is a second function called CUDA get error string that is going to give you a longer explanation what the uh, error code actually means. So these are really handy for, uh, for reporting errors that come from the CUDA API. And the reason why I'm talking about CUDA errors or at this point is that the CUDA kernels and many CUDA API calls are non-blocking or asynchronous, which means that the host thread is going to return back from the function before the function has actually completed itself. And this is because the GPU and the host can actually run completely independent of each other. So if you look at this previous example where we do, did this main copy call, that is a blocking call. So the host is going to wait until the data transfer has been completed, and then it will return you an error code indicating if anything, anything went wrong during the data transfer. But the kernel is asynchronous, meaning that it will simply place the kernel to a queue, and in some point in the future, the kernel will start executing. But the host will actually move to the next, call, next call API call, which is the second transfer from the device to the host, and it will wait until the kernel has finished, and then they will wait for the data transfer to go on. And once the kernel and the data transfer are ready, it will return you the error code. And the way this can cause very unexpected situations is that if something goes gone wrong with the kernel, so when you're launching the, is launching the kernel, everything is fine here, but then when the kernel is running, there's an error. The error code will actually pop up from the CUDA mem copy call. And this is not an error that is anywhere related to data transfer. It's actually related to the kernel that is running. And this is going to be very counterintuitive when you look at the error code and then you see that it's a memory copy operation. And there is nothing wrong with the memory copy operation because it is actually the kernel that was running asynchronously on the GPU. And this happened even if you would use this CUDA get last error and ask, did something go wrong with the kernel launch? And it will report you a success. But this function will only tell you if there is something wrong with the arguments here. So if, let's say, uh, you are giving it the invalid uh, thread block size, then it will give you an error. But if this is all fine, the error that will happen to the kernel is running is still reported by the CUDA mem copy call. So you have to be a uh, if you encounter a situation where you get the error from real place, you must consider all the asynchronous calls that happened earlier. And this uh, ends the, uh, this lecture. So I have prepared you uh, three hands-ons that all exist in this Git repository. The first hands-on is called One Point Threads. And in this hands-on, you will simply learn how to launch a kernel and how to use this uh, uh, thread, uh, thread, thread uh, block dim x, uh, block id x, and uh, thread id x variables. In the second hands on, I'm forcing you to do some error management just because it's, uh, it's something you have to learn how to do. And the first hand, third hands on is basically a more, slightly more complicated one where you actually go and allocate a memory buffer from the GPU. You will do the data transfer and then you will be modifying a, a kernel that I've already provided. We have a question. Yes, yes. So it, it will wait until the stream is empty and then start the movement. And since the kernel is based on the stream, it, it is forced to wait for it to do it. So, uh, I think for now we have uh, 40 minutes before the uh, lunch break. So I will be ending this uh, webinar.
and moving on to, to back to the hands-on meeting.